So last week, I saw the movie Heretic, and this movie definitely lives up to the hype. It is so good. And there are countless symbolic ideas here from the religious side and the non-religious side, and we're gonna dive into all of it from the very beginning all the way to the very end. Like Mr. Reed's goal in philosophy, the difference between Pax and Barnes, the polygamy discussion, the Radiohead Monopoly discussion, those resurrected prophets, Barnes contraceptive, and the climax in the basement, and of course, the ending with the butterfly. And so much more, so let's get into this deep dive analysis. So before I get into the first scene, I wanna stop the overall purpose of this movie and what the filmmakers are trying to tell the audience. So here's some insight from co-writer directors Scott Beck and Brian Woods. We say that Heretic is equal opportunity at both supporting certain beliefs, but also kind of coming down on them. And we're certainly asking questions that we purposely aren't delivering answers for. Because the core ambition of this movie is really for you to engage in it at a level of introspection where you're able to reflect. We find ourselves more excited to embrace the mystery, the idea of who knows, and the movie Heretic is an exploration of those anxieties. So based on these quotes and the rest of this Ringer Movies interview, it's very clear that this film is trying to explore religion from both sides, the good things it can offer and some of the less complimenting things, as well as some of the overlooked and untold history behind many religions. And the setup for this brutally honest exploration of religion starts with two young women, Sister Paxton and Sister Barnes. Paxton and Barnes are Mormon missionaries traveling through the city to promote Mormonism and convert and baptize members of their community. And in this opening scene centered around the two of them, we immediately notice similarities, yet also differences in their attitude toward the religion they both share. Paxton displays this shining optimism and unquestioning loyalty to her religion. Whatever is written in the text is exactly what she believes. However, at the same time, Paxton does have this lingering curiosity for the unknown taboo territory that she is always known to be so forbidden. In the opening scene, she hesitantly expresses her feelings about a pornographic video she happened to be watching where she believed the female performer was deeply ashamed of what she was doing. And in a way, for Paxton, that was God speaking to her and confirming that her her way of faith was true and righteous. But the fact that she made the effort to navigate to and eventually watch a pornographic video shows that there's this curiosity for life outside of these boundaries of her beliefs. And this is very often the case for many teens and young adults who grow up in these heavily sheltered religious environments and are eventually inevitably exposed to the many temptations and vices of our modern world. And this is exactly what we see Paxton going through. On the other hand, we have Barnes who wasn't born into Mormonism. She is certainly at this point a woman of faith, but shows this higher level of maturity and awareness than Paxton, all shown through her incredibly telling body language and facial expressions. There's also this slight element of guilt you can very clearly see. It's as if she has already experienced some of this forbidden territory that Paxton is so curious or shameful about and has to play dumb a little. For example, having some insight into the different condom sizes that Paxton is asking about, but claiming she only knows because her sister who was married has told her. And of course, we'll find out the reason for this guilt later on in the movie and later on in this video. But while Paxton and Barnes are very different in many ways, they're both very clearly on the same side of this religious philosophical commentary. And on the other side of this religious philosophical commentary in the film is Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed, as we learn in the film, is this psychopathic man who has studied countless religions all as part of his goal to figure out the one true religion, or if there even is a true religion at all. Reed invites Paxton and Barnes into his house to be test subjects for his experiment of their faith and to prove the truth of his rigorous research and final conclusion. And when Beck and Woods are asked about Mr. Reed's philosophy and motivation, they say he's testing his hypothesis. He spent his entire life studying religion, and he has a theory that he's testing on this night. He's not positive if he's right, but he thinks he's right. And to lure these young women deeper and deeper into his home, he purposely makes these innocent mistakes that make him seem more inviting, approachable, and harmless. Like when he mixes up their names, Paxson and Barnes, but their name tags are right there on their coats. And when he mispronounces Moroni, when he's been very clearly studying Mormonism for several years. He clearly does this strategically. It sort of gives him more of a foot in the door to ask more pressing questions without seeming too imposing. First, he asks about how Mormonism once allowed for polygamy, which was practiced by the leaders of the Mormon church. But by 1890, through Revelation, polygamy was no longer accepted. Reed argues that the leaders of the church, specifically founder Joseph Smith, needed to justify his temptation for infidelity. 
And the concept of revelation, put simply new truth spoken from God, is just an excuse for the church to adjust to modern society and maximize their number of current and potential members. Sister Barnes counter argues that polygamy was accepted at the time to grow the population more rapidly, which was necessary when now it is not. And immediately, I love the little detail that Barnes is always the one to have a rebuttal, while Paxton often stays very quiet when it comes to having a counterargument. It very subtly highlights that Paxton, being born into her religion and being so undyingly loyal, has never openly questioned her own beliefs and really challenged herself. Barnes, on the other hand, has likely asked herself these questions, so when Reed has a challenging point, Barnes has a response. It's one of my favorite details in the movie. And I think it serves as an explanation for why Barnes has been able to convert more people than Paxton. Barnes claims she has converted about eight or nine people, while Paxton admits she has converted zero. Barnes has a broader understanding of her religion, so she can provide more comprehensive guidance for people who are truly curious and interested. And while Reed does seem more well-read and convincing than Paxson and Barnes, not everything he's saying is completely factual or accurate. He does often heavily theorize and state speculation as fact. And this is why he needs the girls in his home so badly. He needs them for further testing of his hypothesis, which for now is just hypothesis. Beck and Woods actually highlight how they don't want Reed to be perfect, and they particularly wanted to base him off of common public figures like Jordan Peterson, who may sometimes appear more sure and intelligent than they may actually be. Mr. Reed is someone who is capable of generating word salad that sounds really thoughtful and intelligent, but maybe upon reflection, it's a little hollow. He was an amalgamation of a lot of these different figures. One example of this is when Reed says, with great power comes great responsibility. And Paxton guesses Spider-Man. As we all know, the line is said by Uncle Ben in the Spider-Man comics and movies, but Reed corrects her and says Voltaire. When actually, it isn't fact that French writer and philosopher of the 18th century Voltaire said this first. It's only a speculation that he said it, and some may even say a misinterpretation. So since Paxton and Barnes likely have no idea who Voltaire is, they're disarmed and can't help but trust his word, which isn't completely true. Once everyone moves to the book room, Reed asks whether they still believe his wife is behind the door, or if they are only convincing themselves into something they know is a lie because they are now scared for their lives. He goes on to explain that this is exactly what religion is, providing one's own comfort through self-convincing out of the ultimate fear of death. Which of course isn't completely true for all religious people, but maybe for some of them. And the concept of regular self-convincing for comfort ties back largely to that very first scene. The element of self-convincing that may be going on in Paxton's head. And Reed continues his argument by introducing a series of board games. First Landlord's Game, then Monopoly, and then a couple newer versions of Monopoly. He also then discusses a series of songs. The Hollies, The Air That I Breathe, Radiohead's Creep, and Lana Del Rey's Get Free, which are all very similar instrumentally. And of course, because of that, they've sparked this chain of lawsuits and threats. And ultimately, Reed's point is that these new iterations of the same game and the same song have the exact same strategy as new religions, updating the same source material to appeal to a larger percentage of the modern world. The church is a business, the missionaries are salespeople, and the religion itself is a product. That is Reed's point. That is his ultimate conclusion. And so, Certainly, Reed's hypothesis and arguments aren't as indestructible as they may sound at first. Sister Barnes once again pokes holes in those arguments by highlighting the religious persecution over the Jewish people historically that have largely reduced Judaism's popularity, and the massive differences between all of these religions that Reed is simply looking over, claiming that the comparison between the board games and the songs and the religious texts is invalid. But Reed is still persistent to push these girls further into his twisted experiment to prove this conclusion to them and therefore prove to himself that his hypothesis is fact. So once the girls get to the bottom of the steps, they become witnesses to what Reed calls a miracle. A supposed prophet walks in who looks like she's on the brink of death and finally dies by eating a poison blueberry pie. Moments later, when the girls come back down the stairs, that woman is alive again, describing what she's seen, blinding white lights, clouds but not in heaven, and coming to the conclusion that it isn't real. 
which is an idea that I'll come back to very shortly. And very soon, Barnes is killed by Reed, where he reveals that she has had a contraceptive implant that she would, of course, be shamed for by her church and has been keeping a secret. And of course, that is the element of guilt that we've been seeing in her body language since the very beginning of the film. That's what she's been concerned about. And here, Reed claims that the contraceptive implant is a chip and Barnes is an android. And I'm sure he's saying this as a test for Paxton to see how willing she is to buy into a lie for her own personal comfort. It's also, of course, a mockery from Reed toward Paxton because ultimately Reed's philosophy about this whole thing is that buying into a lie like this for comfort is the whole idea of being religious. And here, Paxton responds by admitting that it's a contraceptive implant. And at this moment, we get to see this sudden character shift within Paxton, where she has now become a lot more willing to admit to the criticisms over religion that Reed makes, yet also at the same time, is becoming a lot more willing to provide a counter argument to those criticisms. It's like this moment of growth and clarity for Paxton, this detachment from blind faith while still being wholly, completely religious. She explains how what the resurrected prophet said is true to those who approach death, but her mentioning it isn't real is off the script she was following because that prophet is only an actor. And Paxton suspects Reed has multiple so-called prophets to perform a trick to make it look like one is being resurrected. When Paxton finds the basement with the other dead and alive prophets, she realizes Reed is keeping them in prison to perform this trick to the next guest. And these prophets are only missionaries who have visited the house before her. And finally, Paxton realizes and Reed admits that this whole night was orchestrated by Reed for Paxton to end up in the exact positions she's in, in the exact circumstances she's in. And by orchestrating this, Reed is claiming that religion is all about control. And for someone as religiously conditioned as Paxton, Reed is claiming that she is vulnerable enough for him to specifically and perfectly manipulate her into any particular situation. This is why Reed accidentally switching the bike lock keys was not a mistake. He actually purposely moved the bike lock key from Barnes coat to Paxson's coat because he knew that Paxson would be the one at the bottom of the basement at the door with the bike lock on it. And by utilizing this level of precise control over multiple human beings, Reed is essentially playing his own form of God, most notably symbolized by him building the miniature model of the house and looking over it like he's the one true creator of this world, looking down on the humans he knows the fate of. And as we approach the end of the film, we eventually see that Paxton and Reed both stab each other and end up laying on the floor next to one another. And surprisingly, Paxton, when speaking to Reed, admits to the likelihood of her prayers being ineffective and possibly futile, but still claim she'll pray anyway because it's an act of selflessness, compassion, and humility. And one very pivotal concept that I noticed was when Reed was getting closer to Paxton as both of them were slowly dying, which I felt like was a subtle criticism on some people who are non-religious, where when death is approaching, non-believers actually move closer to a place of God and religion out of a feeling of fear and final desperation, which when I think about it is the opposite of why Paxton prays. Paxton's prayers derive from her selflessness when that kind of desperation derives from selfishness. A man who believes he is somewhat of of a god clinging to a girl who was saying her prayers in her last moments I thought was very powerful. And at this point, this is where the film gets very subjective. Barnes suddenly appears, kills Reed with the nail board, and then suddenly falls back to her death. From one angle, this could be seen as a miracle resulting from Paxton's prayer, where God is saving Paxton through Barnes. Or in a reality where God does not exist, this could be a miracle-like situation where her friend Barnes just had enough life left to save her friend. And from this sequence on, the whole rest of the film exists through this subjective lens, where from one angle you can see it in a world where God exists, and from the other angle you can see it in a world where God doesn't exist, and it's completely up to you. And when Paxton examines the model of the house, she figures out an escape, and in the final shot, Paxton sees a butterfly land on her finger, a possible touch from Sister Barnes. Just as Paxton described, she would want to be reincarnated. But then, the butterfly appearing non-existent in the final shot of the film, offering a variety of possibilities, where one, Paxton survives and is receiving a loving message from her friend in a new life form. Or Paxton survives and is only imagining her friend in a new life form. Or Paxton is dying in the basement and rising to this true concept of heaven. Or Paxton is dying in the basement and only dreaming of this concept of heaven in her last moments. 
And while there are multiple interpretations, they all unite to deliver one message. Whether this delicate creature is a true blessing from the angel of Barnes above, or simply a figment of Paxton's religious imagination, mere belief can spark hope, strengthen our love, and lift us up out of our lowest of moments. All right, this is my analysis. I would love to discuss any of your thoughts and answer any of your remaining questions. Just let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and see you later.